Okay, so um, I, I found out, discovered just through read that people needed deliverance. And uh, so the Lord was my teacher in this. And um, a, a lot of the people I've seen healed is because I understood um, that deliverance is a part of healing very often. And uh, so, so I'm going to share some things today and I'm not intending to be controversial. I'm being real and being vulnerable and sharing part of God's teaching in my life. So what made me decide to bring this today was because uh, someone sent me a clip of a pastor called Ken Fish. And um, he shared something which I think we all at least ought to have under our bonnet. We, we need to understand this. And he began with reading Psalm 91. And it might be a net that um, I put Psalm 91 to music last year with a video lyric. It might be that we have that at some point. So this is a most wonderful Psalm of protection that has been particularly um, relevant to this time of COVID, this time of shaking, this time of uncertainty. And so it has been a, a great source of blessing to many including our own fellowship, our gathering. And, you know, we, we, you know, we just simply believe it. So it was a, a shock when some of the people got COVID. So I'm being real now because you, you've believed these words that are here, um, like verse 3 of Psalm 91, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and the deadly pestilence. Um, also verse 6 in particular, nor of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, pestilence like COVID, nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near you. So there are Verse 10, there shall no evil befall you or any plague come near your tent. So he began reading this psalm and he was a Hebrew scholar. I'm going to go on from here. So he decided to look at this word pestilence in verse 6 in the Hebrew. And he found that the Hebrew word was Q-E-T-E-B. I'm pronouncing it K-T-E-B. And um, he found out that that was the Hebrew word for destruction. And as he 
then looked into his Hebrew Aramaic lexicon, um, he found out that the rabbis considered that Keten was an evil spirit. This is the rabbis. And that this particular evil spirit was responsible for many sicknesses. And so he, as a pastor, was dealing with people with COVID and getting many requests to deal with it. And so he began to pray a deliverance prayer from Kate instead of healing prayer. Now, I resonated with this because I had many calls from people with COVID. I didn't have the name KTEB, but as I prayed in tongues, I found that the Lord was leading me into deliverance prayer and there was an almost immediate response. Temperatures came down, appetite was restored. Um, strength began to come back. It was in some the start of a healing process with others immediately there was um, you know, so we could go into individual examples, but one member um, sent for the ambulance because he felt so poorly. And um, then waiting for the ambulance, he had some prayer and the Lord told him, do not go to hospital. And so when the ambulance arrived, he said he wouldn't go with them. And they said, if you don't come, you'll die. I mean, talk about a curse. They said, you've got COVID, pneumonia, and two other things which are forgotten now. But the Lord had spoken and said, don't go into hospital. I'm going to heal you. And he stuck to his guns. And we prayed a deliverance prayer over him. And the next day, he was already tons better. And of course, none of those awful things happened to him. So I was already on the same wavelength as this man who is called Ken Fish. Someone's asked in the chat. And um, <clears throat> so he found that many people were healed in response to his prayer for deliverance from Ketan which means destruction. I am I'm going to kind of enlarge on this. So just stay with me if you've already heard about Ken Fish. So some, some were healed instantly, some over a few days. But what came to me strongly was that we, need a breakthrough against the demonic power of sickness. Um, destruction isn't just COVID. It's cancers and other deadly diseases. And my heart says that with the NHS being in such I'm going to call it disarray. Vital services are having to be put 
on one side cancers are not getting checked and things like this and um, I'm, I'm believing that this is the time that God is going to restore our faith in the authority that he's given us to deal with these things. He's given us the authority. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this, but we have to recognize it. So one thing he discovered as well was that it did not work as well as just intercession. In other words, the people and presumably the demonic thing holding them in sickness needed to be under the sound of his voice. So even on deathbeds and in hospital, he wouldn't just intercede, he would get a phone to their ear. And Pray. Yes, Paul, it's true. There is a spirit of deception. I believe it's being broken uh, slowly, um, but truth can't be hidden for forever. So this is then made me just come out with a simple statement that the sound of our voices and the power of them is also important because God spoke and the world was formed. He surely could have just thought it and it would have happened. So he says, um, so this is a, a, it's a bit of instruction that he found that he would begin his prayer by rebuking Kateb and commanding as the authority that it release the individual, that it would get out of the individual. He would say things like leave now or get, get out or come out or something like that. Um, but gradually the Lord also began to sort of build on this basic foundation. And um, he would pray get out of the lungs or whatever was the most affected part of the person get out of the throat leave the heart or whatever was affected and he would command the spirit to release its hold over these organs and the vital organs of the body and he would then only then think about praying for a healing of any damage which had been done through the COVID. And um, so I'm, I'm, there's, there's lots more. I'm going to just talk a little, a little bit more about its link to other sicknesses, cater Because Jesus did, I started looking at things and found that Jesus spoke about spirits of sickness. And uh, it seems to me that there has been some demonic process in 
the holy merchants. And so the devil is a deceiver. So it, as he began to pray healing, we'll just finish this one. He would ask the Holy Spirit, as the Lord to cleanse the sinuses, to cleanse and clear um, the body from all the results of in Infection, especially um, the distress as well, because if people can't breathe properly, it's this fear and distress. And so he would deal also with fear or distress. So Annette put that, it's the first one, Q-E-T-E-B. So, um, then he, he would just release that healing, as I've said, into all the organs and ask the Lord to restore taste and smell. But he said then a sentence which impacted me. He said, may the church become the first line of defense. The first line of defense against COVID and sickness, it's like, it's like this was such a huge part of what Jesus died for. So he never said preach the word without adding heal the sick and deliver the band. Deliver from demons. In other words, as we will just look at now in just some scriptures to back this up. I can't answer you, Annette, whether it is that ministry that you mentioned, but I have written down and I'll put it in the chat uh, at the end what may or might not be a link to him um, I think it was Madeline Bartley who sent me this way so she may know if if, uh, if that's not right so if you turn in your bibles to Luke chapter 4 and we'll just do a 20 minute Bible study on deliverance. Now, this could be a huge topic. We could be here for weeks. Um, but I know that I personally have paid a price. I personally have paid a price for ministering deliverance as the church has said, well, a Christian can't be affected by a spirit. And um, I, I did an awful lot, a, a, a lot of heart searching, but Bible because I don't want anything that's not in the word and neither do you. You're not interested in my opinion. And that's right. So I think Alison, you need to just mute. Um, and then I, I, just, I just wanted, what was the, what was the ch 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 chapter? It's Luke chapter four. And we're going to begin at verse 18. All right, thank you. I'll have to do that now, sorry. Okay. So, um, this is the first words that the Lord spoke, having been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's now coming out of the wilderness. And he's coming out in the power 
of the Holy Spirit. And he finds this messianic prophecy and he reads it in the synagogue. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, my amplified says those who are bruised and crushed and broken down by calamity and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and um, he missed out about the day of vengeance of our God because that's not what he was there for It's word for word from Isaiah 61, except for those words about vengeance, because he's not there for vengeance. He's there to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, which is the year when the slaves, those bound, are set free. It's, it was the time for the undoing of the effects of the fall. It was the time to manifest the kingdom. Um, and so the rest, it will do you good to read the whole of Luke chapter 4. Because the rest of the chapter is him living out what he's just spoken. He, this wasn't just an exercise in, in the Torah. This was a proclamation, devil, you'd better watch out because I'm coming to institute this. Healing, deliverance, salvation, comfort. I'm here. And so the rest of Luke chapter four, he's doing these things. So you'll find, for example, verse 33. Now, in the synagogue, there was a man who was possessed by the foul spirit of a demon. In the synagogue. And the demon cried out with a loud, deep and terrible cry. I think this must be one of the first times the demons had cried. They'd had it pretty much their own way. But now they knew that the manifesto of the kingdom was in operation and that they were subject to the Son of God. And we look at verse 41. Please see the power of of this we'll read 40 and 41 now at the setting of the sun so that meant the sabbath had finished they were all waiting for the sun to set to make their way to jesus because of the sabbath rules all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. He laid his hands on every one of them and cured them. And 
see people read that verse, but and demons even came out of how many people? Many. The demons came out of many people screaming and crying out, you are the son of God. But this was his authority. He rebuked them. He said, be quiet. You're not having your own way now because the kingdom is here. And um, this must have been an incredible, incredible demonstration. What a demonstration of the change that had come now that Jesus, our Redeemer, had announced the kingdom. So, has so much changed in society that many demons don't need to come out from people? During our years in particular in Spain, People were deeply into the occult. People were into idolatry. The drug addicts were all addicted and bound in that addiction. People were been dedicated to idols. Sexual sin has always been among us. And these give ground so no Christian can be possessed in the sense of owned by. It's a wrong word. But we can have areas where we've given ground to the enemy. And that ground needs to be cleansed and needs to be cleared and it can go in various um, levels from a, a foothold, a stronghold, a bondage, multi-bondage. And um, so I learned a lot because now I wasn't dealing with a drug addict, I was dealing with Ricardo Samuel. Jose Luis, I was dealing with people who had these needs in their life and nobody was meeting them. Many of them had had to become male prostitutes to pay for their drugs. I dealt with things I didn't want to deal with. I didn't want to talk about them. I didn't want to. I never thought that that would be kind of a part of what the Lord had. But for eight years, I ministered almost every day. Sometimes all day, every day. And the healings came through the deliverance. The drug addicts were healed from hepatitis and AIDS because they were delivered. Julie Livens was with us in Spain, who's here on the thing today, and she can confirm. that the drug addicts came off their drugs through the power of prayer. 
and we're here with them. This, the needs in society are huge. But the, we've played at church. Oh, we've been very good at preaching the word. But what about healing the sick and delivering the bound and raising the dead? I hope you can hear my heart. It's not a word of condemnation. It's a word of longing to see that sentence, to see the church become the first line of defense. To see now there is a vacuum almost as people can't anymore put their trust in the NHS. And that's not saying that there aren't very, very good people who are doing their best, but they've had to cancel so many ops as well. And there is something like the Liverpool pathway and like other things that should never be where people are needing to have trust. So we're going to look. I hope you're all with me. Can you just wave to me if you're getting yeah. something out of this? <laughs> you're, not, you're not upset. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. <laughs> okay, good. So Luke 10, 17, we can look at a few verses. Um, I stayed mostly in Luke to keep it tidy. Luke 10 and verse 17. People might say, well, that's all right for Jesus. But Jesus gave authority to his disciples because he knew he was going away. And finally, beyond disciples, to all those who believe. Look, folks, we are believers. And believers that de defies gender, it defies race, it defies age. It's just defined by believing. So in verse 17, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And that was pre-cross. How much more now? And so he said, verse 19, behold, and you take it for yourself, I have given you, you put your name in there, authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power that the enemy possesses. Do you want any more power and authority than that? How can you have any more authority? because he's already given us authority over all the power that the enemy possesses. So what we see is that 
this was not a side issue. This was not something with one mention. This is all over the world. And people in churches on the whole are not taught. I wasn't taught it. God taught me when I was desperate to help people. And I, I, I just sometimes sat and watched people, watched God do it. So if I if I started now to begin to tell you of the miracles that came through deliverance, as well as healing miracles just on their own, you, you would be here all day. And maybe sometimes I should give time to give glory to God for what I saw him do. We're just in this same chapter in Luke chapter 10. It would seem as though the Good Samaritan is unconnected. To what has gone before, but it isn't. I'm going to just explain very quickly. Because you all know the story. And we've all just been taught, oh, well, you know, we have to love one another, and love our neighbour. But it's a lot, lot more than that. So it begins in verse 30 in response to who is my neighbour? And um, yeah, it's. Um, I once heard Heidi Baker speak on this, and I was nearly in tears um, because of all the neighbors in Mozambique that needed the power of the Lord. But a certain man. So when it just says a certain man, it's it's a generality. But it's me and it's you. And it's your neighbours. A certain man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's life's journey. Let's take that as life's journey. When he fell among robbers. Now the devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. So it's saying during life's journey, we can be attacked. These robbers left him for dead. We can be bruised. We can be robbed of what's our rightful inheritance and the church has been robbed of the teaching of its authority. left him half dead, a 
a set hat. And by coincidence, a certain priest was going down that road. He represents the church. He should have been the first line of defense. He should have been the one who brought the compassion of the Lord and he passed by on the other side. And I, anyway, I, I'll go on because some of it's very obvious and a Levite did the same. But a certain Samaritan. Now, I just going back to verse 32 a moment, it doesn't imply whether the Levite was sympathetic. He passed by, but he might have looked and thought, oh, poor man. Oh, what a shame. It, it's really, really sad that I can't help him. And this is a lot of times how the church is. It's not without compassion. But it's without the knowledge of how to help. But a certain Samaritan. Now, Jesus picked a Samaritan, not out of the air, but because the Jews and the Samaritans were not natural friends, shall we put it that way maybe even enemies. And he was moved with compassion and he went and dressed his wounds. Listen, folks, this Samaritan is a picture of Jesus. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. But he saw our mess. And he came where we were. And he didn't just stay in heaven and say, what a shame. What a shame they stayed. What a shame they found. And get on with running the universe. He came where they were. He came where we were. And he did his Luke chapter 4. He dressed his wounds. He cleansed him because he was crushed. He'd been robbed. He was crushed by life's calamities. And he poured in oil. It's what he does to us, the oil of the Holy Spirit. And then he set him on his own beast. In other words, it's not through our self-effort that we get to the inn. And he paid. So Jesus has paid the price for us to go into heaven, a sacrificial price. And he uses this parable to answer who is my neighbor? And then he says, go and do likewise. It's all these things. It's rescue from the work of the robbers. It's healing. It's practical help. It's love. It's caring. It's tending.
I'll read one more scripture and I'll give you others to study. But still in Luke chapter 13, verse 11 and then verse 16. He was again in the synagogue. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There was a woman there who for 18 years had an infirmity caused by a spirit. Do you think that demons have stopped causing infirmity? This was bad. She was bent completely on unable to stand up. And when Jesus saw her, he didn't say, I'm going to heal you. He said, woman, you are released from your infirmity, from the spirit of infirmity. And here was religion again, objecting because it was the Sabbath, being religious instead of loving. So in verse 16, which is the other verse, ought not this woman the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be loosed. She wasn't just sick for 18 years, Satan had bound her. And it took authority to unbound her. But she'd been in the synagogue like that for 18 years. Some people will go to their grave bound still because though so they've been in the church. Sorry, it sounds, it's just that I, I care about people. So I'll give you three scriptures to look at and then I'll just explain the going for into a breakout group. Mark 16, verse 17. Acts chapter five, verse 16. And Acts chapter 10. Verse 38. Now there's loads, loads more. I've just tiptoed over the surface of a very, very contentious in a way subject. But although as I say, I've paid a price for believing these things. Religion says, how can a demon tabernacle? Here's that religious word with the Holy Spirit. Well, of course he can't because the, the spirit belongs to God, but he can have strongholds and footholds. And Jesus explained what those footholds were and said, don't give them, don't give footholds to the enemy through bitterness. And other things which he explains in Ephesians. So he talks. And of course, you're not doing anyone a favor if they're not a Christian, if you minister deliverance to them because there could be seven words that come. 
So who are you going to minister deliverance to? Can't deliver, can't minister it to the unsaved. But if you're going to say, you know, that there can't be issues that need dealing with in the saved, then that's just a waste of space to put deliver the bound in the Great Commission. So as we go into some breakout groups, going to go for 15 minutes. We may build on this next time and have a bit longer. But this is just to give you time to talk together about KTEB, about the Good Samaritan and our part. It's an opportunity if anyone feels they need prayer because they've got lingering effects from COVID. Then these breakout groups are the opportunity for you to just, not just be people who are receiving teaching, but people who are acting. That's the main thing. We have to act on what we're taught. We have to live the kingdom. That was my message on Friday. Probably most of you heard it, but this is on my heart so much now. In these days, when the clash of the kingdoms is so strong, we must live and live out kingdom of light, a kingdom of grace, a kingdom of love, a kingdom of healing. So I'll see you in 15 minutes time. All right, bless you.